Uh, thank you everyone for taking the time out of their busy schedule to join us today. My name is William Bell, Executive Vice President of Products at Phoenix Nap. Uh, and I have Michael Diemer, an inside systems engineer from Veeam. Thank you for joining me, Michael. Absolutely, absolutely. Glad to be here, William. All right. And today we're going to talk about, well, everyone's not favorite subject in ransomware. Um, we've got uh, a great partner in Beam that has taken a lot of steps to ensure uh, that customers that are leveraging their products stay protected uh, from ransomware. And uh, we're going to kind of walk through that whole uh, portfolio technology today, what that looks like for you on prem, what that looks like for you in a hosted cloud service, and what that looks like for you in terms of offsite data protection as uh, disaster recovery and backup as a service are concerned. So with that, a level set a little bit. Uh, if you guys aren't familiar with Phoenix Snap, uh, we're one of the original four Veeam cloud service providers. Uh, we've been a partner of theirs uh, for a really long time now, a little over seven years. Um, we have data centers in 15 locations um, and six more global network pops around the globe. Um, we're delivering Veeam-based cloud services in six geodiverse locations, uh, and we really pride ourselves on a couple of things, performance, security, and our dedication to customer success, right? We want to make sure that everyone is truly happy with our service uh, and they're getting exactly uh, what we uh, told them that we would deliver. Um, and, you know, along with that, we're always developing new technologies that integrate with our partner community to make sure that we're upping our game and, and enhancing the delivery of those services worldwide. Here's kind of a picture of the footprint. So you guys can take a look at where you're at, see if anything's close, you know, try to understand uh, the scope and kind of the breadth of what we're talking about today. And with that, I want to throw out a couple polls just to kind of get a sense of the audience, understand where everyone's at in their journey, um, and help Michael and I gauge our presentation day to make a little bit more sense to you uh, as an end user. So I'm going to go ahead and kick off uh, our first poll. And there you go. It's going to take a minute and spin. I don't know why it does this, but it tends to uh, be a little wonky when I press the, uh, the go button on the poll. All right. So everyone should see this. If you could take a minute, uh, look at all the, uh, the responses that are there. We have software as a service, e-commerce, finance, healthcare, education, government, gaming, entertainment. Tell me about your industry vertical, where you're at. That'll help me really kind of gauge our presentation today and make sure we're hitting exactly what you're looking for. All right, we're going to get, okay, perfect. We've climbed well into the 70% of responses, so that's exactly what I'm looking for. And then looks like we've got a lot of folks kind of in that general business area, e-commerce, delivery some finance, healthcare, a lot of education, government. Makes sense, Michael, you guys do really well in the education and SLED space. Um, and uh, all right, that'll help us out. Perfect, so I'm gonna close that one down. And then we're gonna look at company size this time. How large is your organization? Um, what does that look like to you? And I, I have an idea of where this is gonna kind of settle in. Uh, but I, I'd love to kind of understand for the folks on the call um, where they exist. Ah, yes, I, I kind of expected those numbers, right? So the answer is up to 500 employees, 501 to 1,000, and more than 1,000 employees. Um, Beam's really starting to make headway in the enterprise space. Not there traditionally, uh, as I expected, um, right around 72% of small business. So. That's good, hitting that mid-market, starting to get there. Those responses are climbing up as well. And Michael, congratulations, you're making some headway into that enterprise market. <laughs> Thank you. All right, last one here. How much data do you have? Again, I kind of expect to see this on the lower end, given the audience that we have today, which is great because honestly, ransomware is a lot of times much more detrimental to the small business than it is to the large enterprise, right? Um, not only are you struggling to get your protections in place, um, but a lot of times 
losing one bit of data can be you know detrimental to your business uh, completely. Um, so I think that uh, kind of resonates. So less than 100 T, 100 to 500, 500 to 100 T. All right, good. 75%. I love the participation, everybody. Um, love that you guys are taking the time to press the button. Gives us a chance to gauge everything, and I think uh, it's going to make the presentation that much better. So I'm going to go ahead and close that down. 81% less than 100 T, 15% 100 to 500, and 4% 500 to 1 petabyte. Uh, those 4% of you, uh, you guys got a nice size environment. I think that... Uh, you know, Veeam's got some great stuff that they've released in V10. We're not going to talk about it today uh, at scale, <laughs> but uh, that that NAS backup stuff is probably helping you out with unstructured data over 500T. So I'm um, going to close that down. All right. So uh, with that, I'm going to take uh, this moment to introduce Michael Deemer. I said systems engineer, insight systems engineer at Veeam. He's gonna kind of walk us through um, the the big picture, so to speak, of ransomware and how it affects your business. Take it away, Michael. Well, thank you everyone. Uh, thanks for joining and thanks for the intro, William. Again, my name is Michael Deemer and I'm a systems engineer here at Veeam Software. And today we're gonna be going over ransomware. What is ransomware? Well, you guys might have heard of it, well, but it's a type of malicious software that we like to call malware. It restricts access to computers and or files until the ransomware is paid. Um, it, it spreads through cryoptivity, uh, cryoptivity uh, encrypts and holds ransom data or ransom data sensitive, um, and then sometimes actually leaks the sensitive sensitive information. So maybe they actually get it and they see that it actually is more sensitive than the, the, than others, and they're actually going to use that as leverage. So it combines asymmetric and somatic encryption to lock out users in the MDF or the managed file transfer or specific directories. Uh, what this does is it operates under the assumption that the encrypted data that is important enough that users are willing to pay it back. So imagine you get up in the morning, you got a big meeting ahead of you, and you get up, you open up your laptop, and all of a sudden everything is encrypted. Well, what do you, what's your next steps, right? Not everybody, you know, has a, a big IT company is going to go out there and do it. So. So every everyone in every vertical is at risk. Again, this data transformation isn't a fad. It's not going anywhere. It, it, unless you're using pen and a piece of paper and you have no electronic database or anything like that, that's the only time you're not going to be affected, right? But well, but let's just say that's that's very few and far in between in any, in this, in the, any industry, um, from healthcare to financial to manufacturing. I mean, think about how much uh, information you give just for healthcare. They have to protect all the HIPAA information and, and, and you know, there's very sensitive information that they're protecting. Financial re financial services, they're protecting on two fronts. Uh, they have to, one, keep up with all the new regulations that are coming out. And then also the other front is the growing ransomware threat. It's huge. It's always developing. People are rolling out new malicious software day in and day out. Manufacturing to higher ed, education to retail. I mean, it's everywhere, you know, manufacturing, they have to protect again on two fronts with logistics, getting it to and from, and then also their intellectual properties, making sure that it's not being shipped out to another, you know, company or another country and actually, you know, ripping them off. Um, higher education, making sure that their students are safe, their faculty is safe, making sure their, their devices and, and their infrastructure is not going to be compromised and leak all that personal information. Retail. I mean, I know I've been in line and maybe there was some type of outage and maybe it wasn't related to malware, but how, how often does that slow it down when you can't swipe a card or just pay cash? I mean, that's where malware comes into play. It, it really hinders that. To minimize the downtime, that's why we have that, right? Telecommunications, you know, think about your major your major brand, you know. What if your major brand went out and they said they've been hit with malware or ransomware? What would that do for you? Would you would you move on? And then and then you know the other one, oil and gas. Think how complex their 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 environments are. That's where we have to protect, right? Let's move on to the next one here. So let's kind of go over the ransomware history, right? So 
So when was ransomware first invented? Well, it may seem like a fairly recent new phenomenon, but ransomware was actually invented by a mysterious sounding Dr. J.L. Pop back in 1989. Dr. J.L. Pop was actually, in fact, an evolution biologist who thought he would increase his notoriety with a World Health Organization conference in that year, right? And then what he did, he, he distributed a whole bunch of different malware that was infected on some disklets. So 1989, you don't have, you don't have CDs. You don't have DVDs. You have little disclets. He pushed them out. They had a survey on them. And once they got actually, they would do the survey. And actually after three or four times that, that machine would reboot, on the fourth time it would encrypt all the data. So from there on out, there was actually a couple different uh, uh, colleges and studies that actually deleted 10 years worth of data just to make sure that they didn't have to pay that ransom. Now, Starting in 2012, the use of ransomware scams has grown internationally. So it's not just local anymore. Uh, it's major ransomware. Trojans and, and renovation have begun to spread based on the, the Sidel Trojan. Basically, the payload dis displays a warning from the law enforcement agency claiming to be a computer has been used in illegal activities. So you're sitting on your computer, you get this pop-up, it says, hey, you've been doing illegal stuff, and you have to pay the FBI. So this FBI pop-up would come online, and most people, you know, in 212 and 12, didn't really know any better, so they would pay it, you know, and just to unlock the computer. Even if you turn it on and turn it back off, that, that pop-up was still there. Now, moving into 2014, Crypto Wall. So Crypto Wall, we actually... <laughs> Uh, I was an admin during the, this time, and man, 2014 to 2015, it, it took the crown for the most successful ransomware yet, earning its owners millions of dollars. Crypto Wall represents the, the introduction of ransomware as a service platform which allows you to to basically have take your tra traditional criminals you know maybe break into the homes car theft burglary to full-fledged cyber criminals with no technical experience cyber cyber wall went through many many different versions from 2.0 to 4.0 notably they could even roll out a new version over the next weekend you might have a DevOps team that went in there and, and said, hey, this is what we're, we're getting hit with. And by the time they came in Monday, it was a new version, and they had to start all over again. Now, today, ransomware is mostly driven through ransomware as a service platform organized by criminal gangs. Uh, this has become the most skilled in exploring money for victims. They even set up legitimate-sounding call centers to make it easier to pay the ransom. The average attack campaign you net the uh, the criminals millions of dollars with very low risk and and very high dividends for them you know and they don't get caught that's you know that's the other thing cuz they what they use is bitcoin that's how they how that's how they get paid now let's go into the cost of ransomware now the cost of ransomware right how much on in general does it cost well, it's most likely attackers will be paid in e-currency, e like Bitcoin, usually between $300 or $800 on, on average, right? But most recently, you know, it's, it's actually going up quite a bit. You know, they're, they're actually in the thousand from typically from one Bitcoin to three Bitcoin in demand. You know, and that, those Bitcoins, they're on, a, they're on a different scale. Everything moves on a day-to-day -day basis, right? So it can be from one day, it might be 1100 to 3400 the next day, respectively. Note that these attackers are not greedy here. They're resilient on the volume of success. So the volume is what gets them. That's the successful ransomware attacks that generate their income. Rather than individual attacks, they practice on point reflected price that people will actually prepare to pay, even to which if the, to, to get their data back, right? And about 20% of enterprises do this, sadly enough to say. Uh, it makes the ransomware too expensive, and people will simply find a cheaper way to recover their data. The 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 anonymous and e currency like Bitcoin has has credited with su success of ransomware and allowing them effectiveness of gathering money with a no paper trail, receiving payments by check or PayPal credit. It's something that Krabinica has you know slowed down on. They don't want to they don't want to be obvious like that for obvious reasons, right? So how much do you think criminals make in total, right? I mean, let me tell you, they're not on the low end of the pay scale here. Cyber criminals, victims pay out $24 million just to, de to develop the ransomware, right? According to Havoc Group, the, the most amount paid by ransomware in 2016 in the first 
three months alone, first three months, $209 million. By the end of 2016, we were all the way up to $1 billion paid in ransomware. That's huge, huge. Now, moving up to 2017, 2017, it fived X itself. By the end of 2017, we were at a $5 billion for expected cost of ransomware attacks. I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't have $5 billion to pay out on that, let me tell you. The cost of poor availability and catastrophicness, right? So, like, what is, what's the next piece? Oh, let's go that way. And one more. There you go. So it's not just the cost of ransom itself, but it's also the cost of downtime, right? So on average, and these are averagely cost, $80,000 in downtime, $90,000 in the lost cost of data, and with a total of $16 million in 2014. That increased to by $6 million. Now, no, these are not just the cost of ransomware itself, but it's also the cost of downtime, your data loss, you know, trying to figure out how, how to structure your data. Now, granted, these figures are not related just to ransomware, but are increasing numbers that are included in the threat of downtime that ransomware brings. With an average 15 unplanned, unplanned downtime events each year, the availability gap in, is just growing on average to a $16 million. I don't know about you, but I can't afford $16 million for downtime. I mean, that's huge, right? Now, let's kind of dig a little bit deeper here on ransomware. There's a couple of different ones that I kind of want to touch on. So ones that you might see or might have even heard of, uh, which is Lockerware. Basically, it denies access to your computer or the device that you're on, and it requires payment. You know, the, there might be something that comes up on your screen that says, hey, you've used this this computer for illicit crimes, or maybe you you have copyright infringements, you know, and it puts it up there. And no, no matter how many times with m most people, they're going to reboot their machine and hope for the best. But guess what? It's still going to be there when, when you reboot, unless you're going to actually revert to a backup copy, which I hope you have, or you're going to have to pay that ransom. And that always doesn't mean you're going to get your data back. Cryptoware, for instance, it, it prevents access to data in your files. Cryptoware really doesn't have a really high-end encryption, but what it does do is it stops them from even accessing their data. So their, their, their data isn't encrypted, but they can't access it. So it's basically the same thing, right? You can't access, it's no good. Go on to the next one here. More on ransomware, right? So we have a whole bunch of different ways ransomware has kind of evolved over the years from email attachments stored on local and mounted network drives using RSA public keys for, for encryption, crypto wall that I already kind of talked about, which uses asymmetric encryption and it is different and, and it uses a different encryption key to encrypt your data. Locky, right? This uses AES encryption for your algorithm. So this is military grade stuff. You know, they're locking down your data and if you don't pay or you don't have a backup, you're not gonna get it back. One of the ones that I really, really think is, is kind of the most dangerous is Verilock. It's, it's, it's self-reproducing. We like to call it in the IT world a shapeshifter. It, it goes through your network and as soon as your AV, your antivirus finds it, it's already rewritten itself. It's coming from a black box server and it's always getting updates on how to shapeshift, how to move around the network and not be caught. And then, you know, the biggest one from 2014 to 2015, WannaCry. It, you know, it exploits leaked by groups of, of shadow black employees or brokers and uses asymmetric encryption, RSA 2048-bit with mar mo modern architecture. This stuff is high grade. You know, it's it's not just, you know, somebody out there. They, they're, they're paying good money for to encrypt your data. Right? Let's go to the next one here. All systems ago. So I don't know any... OS out there that can't be encrypted, period. I, I've never seen it. I've been in the IT world for many, many years. It, it, Linux, I don't care if you're running Linux, you're running Mac, you're running OS. There's something out there that was made for that, to encrypt your data, to make sure that your data is going to be encrypted and then they can make money off of you. Because at the end of the day, that's that's what they're trying to do. 
Linux, kill disk, for instance, it's going to run through. It's going to make sure all your data is, is, is completely encrypted and you're going to still get the same kind of messages that you would pri previously on, on Windows or Mac or even Ubuntu. You know, it, it, there's nothing out there that's not encrypted proof, unfortunately, at least at this point, right? Go to the next one here. So we have some common affection or uh, infection approaches, right? So you guys have probably always heard of like a Trojan horse. It's really the most common attack vector there is. It goes into your email attachments, it uses malicious micro attachments to, you go in there, you click it, and you, you know, you don't even know you're doing it. You don't know that you're actually installing it. And that's kind of the purpose, right? Removable media. So <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, let's please not, if you see see a USB stick on the side of the road in a Walmart anywhere, let's not plug it in. We actually did a study. Google and two two uh, universities did a study, and forty nine percent actually plugged it into their computer. And guess what? They didn't plug it into like a dev environment or a sandbox where you could test it, you know, without network access. And then it it didn't encrypt their files, but they just wanted to know how many people are actually out there plugging it in. Seeing who is curious. I mean, humans in general are curious creatures, right? But if you see one of those, just throw it away. Or if you really want to see what's inside, put it in a put it in a sandbox. You know, malvertising. Let's move on to that, right? So I don't know how many times you might have seen it on, on a commercial or even seen it in person. You know, uh, so malvertising. What it does is it, it gets into to the the ad uh, infrastructure, right? And then it uses, you know, it'll use like legitimate websites and you'll see it and you might be for Amazon or, or eBay and you don't know it is actually adware, but you click on it. You might say, hey, you need to run this to to get X to get X, Y or Z for free. And you do it because you don't know any better. But hey, that's that's why we're going to have that that discussion here today. Social media texting or or SMS. I actually got a text message this morning that was actually using a JavaScript based code um, and was for like some doggy daycare. And guess what? It wasn't even in my same state or, you know, anywhere in ge geographically located. Right. And they use that. And it, with, with Java text, you, it's very little interaction from user to the malicious person on the other side. Usually they just open the attachment and JavaScript, JavaScript is so powerful, it installs the software on the back end and you're good to go. As in, they're good to go and they're into your system and they can start affecting your, your data, your NAS, whatever's connected to that device. And then lastly, ransomware as a service. These things have vast, vast affiliate networks. They don't have to have the smartest ID guy or, or the smartest person in the room to, to make these work. They have call centers. They, they literally just go to the dark web and they say, hey, I want to start doing ransomware as a service. And they'll give you a list. They'll give you employees. And basically, you know, once you get paid out, it's kind of just a, a circle, right? It, it's some crazy stuff. They, they use that. go to the next one here perfect so so some other common infection approaches right so we talked about emails you know maybe we need to set up a rule that scans all your stuff and maybe you have like a virtual sandbox for any unknown users right attackers use browsers as well extensions i don't know how many times as an admin i've seen it people would download a browser extension and not know that it's actually on the back end doing something that's very bad to the os or the bios skype or other messenger calls right we kind of already talked about that and how the they use javascript to compromise trusted contacts they could even get in there to your contacts the os themselves and then visiting untrusted sites do me a favor when you're doing it when you see it https that's a secure site http not a secure site now again there is some that you that you're going to run into that just aren't secure but just know there there is that kind of software out there and just kind of be more vigilant and then downloading and running untrusted software. I don't know how many times a week I get something from Java that says, hey, your Java is outdated. Well, instead of just clicking on the little box and having it run, I actually personally go out to Java's website, rescan my device to make sure it's actually valuable. And that it's actually something that's gonna, that it's not malicious or it's actually gonna encrypt my software. Now, there's so many different vulnerabilities here. Just know, keep your eyes out, keep vigilant. 
go to the next one here. Now, how do we prepare? In the, is it, you know, we got to be more safe than sorry. We've always heard that, right? But how do we do it? Let's go to the next one. So antivirus, right? Most of you guys are probably running an AV of some sort in your environment, but keeping it your your AV completely up to date, making sure that it's good to go. You know that's that's huge. If you're not doing that, you you, you might have missed an update that you know this uh, Trojan horse or this malware that can now slip in. You know it, it now it could be like a false sense of security as well. You know you like hey I have AV I can't be hit. Well that's that's untrue because there's not an AV out there that, you know, does everything from top to bottom, right? Now, it's also important to ensure that your antivirus and malware solutions are modern and up-to-date. Again, making sure that everything is good. Now, now there is, you know, some some SEGs and ballistic or and basic or rights that you can use that are halfway, you know, protecting everything but you know just just with that being said just make sure that you are good to go and don't have that fa false sense of security with your av there's always going to be something out there that that is that much better and that much smarter that can call some apis now let's move to the next one here one more perfect now how do we prepare for ransom attacks one I don't know how many times I've walked around, you know, and seen it when I was an admin, keeping your software up to date. I know it's easy just to, you know, when you get a Windows update, you say, ah, I'll do it later. I'll do it later. But maybe take that extra 30 seconds, update it, let it reboot, and you'll be good to go. It, it, it helps against ransomware attacks. Performing threat analysis with your security team, you know, going over you know, where your vulnerability are at in the network, you know, that's, that's a really good discussion to have with everybody in the IT industry. And train your staff on security and cyber practices and the best practices for your company, right? So maybe tell all your employees, if you see something coming from an unknown, unknown source, don't open it. And, and, the, and then if you do have something that actually reaches your, your, your company infrastructure, make sure to inform all your employees so that way they're aware. Also, back up all your information every day. I don't know how many times that I, that I hear, hey, you know, I was doing something yesterday and it's completely gone because I either didn't save it or I got ransomware, right? It, it, back it up. Make sure you're, you're going to be good the next day and don't lose that whole day of production, right? And then, you know, back up all the information to a secure offsite. Phoenix Nap, for instance, is a premium BCSP member and they can help you with, with doing that. Go to the next one here. Let's master the three two one rule. You may ask, what is the three two one rule? Well, on the next slide right here, we're gonna kinda dive into it. So it's three different copies, two different types of media in one off site, right? That's it's huge. So three different copies, right? So you're gonna have your full backup, three VB case, for instance, two different types of media. Maybe you go into a local repository and then off to tape, and that one off site. That's where Phoenix Nap is going to come in play and actually allow you to get that air gap site, uh, air gap copy where nothing can actually be written to it, right? That's huge. Making sure that, you know, if maybe your, you know, production data catches on fire and your two different types of media are on fire as well, that's where Phoenix Nap can come in play and, and help you get your production back up and running. Now, when ransomware hits, this is a scary part, right? This is where it kind of gets interesting. Let's just say you have some VMs and your VMs start to go down. Now what? Well, we got to make sure we have a good copy, right? So on the next piece, we're going to see that we're actually going to spin up a virtual sandbox to actually test your backups. Now, with Veeam Virtual Sandbox, we can actually have your backups tested every single time that a backup job is ran. So you can have it simultaneously run. So that way, if you know you have to fail back to that backup job, it's actually going to be one fileable and actually boot and, and, and be back in your production environment as soon as you can put it back there, right? It's a huge key, huge, you know? And let's actually go into the endpoint devices for non-virtualized. So that was a virtualized environment. Let's go over if you just had, you know, a, you know some physical infrastructure here, right? So next one. So Veeam Agent for Linux, right? 
Let's kind of dig into this a little bit. Veeam Agent for Linux makes it easy to follow recommendations that one are air gap. You're going to follow that three to one rule. This is due to, you know, Veeam availability suite. So we can do everything in there. We can Veeam, uh, Veeam backup and replication or uh, backup your repositories, your file systems, and can be used to backup your jobs and move your, uh, move your files off site as well. Move it here. Veeam agent for Microsoft. Let's kind of dig in here a little bit. So maybe you have a couple different ways that you actually have storage. Maybe you have NAS. Maybe you have some removable storage. Maybe you have a different OS for it. Maybe you need to have a, a Linux path instead of a Windows path. Maybe you have tape or maybe some deduplicating devices that you want to back up. This is where Veeam agent for, for Windows can really help you making sure that we can get those backups and, and follow that 3 two, one rule. And then what are the uh, the um, Veeam's response, or let's go to the next one here. There we go. Veeam ransomware recoverability, which is huge. How are we going to recover, right? So let's go to the next one really quick. So Veeam r ransomware recoverability. Uh, rapidly restores and ransomware attacks. It stores snapshots and integration enables fast VM granular level recovery. Huge, granular level. We can go all the way down to the file level if needed. We can restore databases, applications, files, even OS. Maybe you want a bare metal, metal bare metal OS. We can we can do that. We can even we even integrate with you know all the major key players: HPE, NetApp, Nimble. Dell, Dota, Dell uh, Data Domain, EMC, um, and then, you know, the availability to test. That's huge, right? So we have the on-demand sandbox that we can, we can you know, ensure that everything is getting tested, and then sure backup, making sure that those backups are viable if we have to go back to them. And then we have a built-in backup assessment, right, to ensure then prove all your critical VMs are protected with Veeam One, making sure that your Veeam One, that your virtual infrastructure is set up. Maybe you have some VMware Hyper-V hosts that are kind of coming up on some, that their data stores are coming up on some space, or you need to know what the retention period is that you guys currently have set. Or maybe when when you're actually going to start falling off and you're going to run out of space on those data stores. That's where Veeam One can help you. Now we have a large community of cloud service providers, and today we have on the call Phoenix Snap, which is one of our Platinum VCSP partners. And I'm going to turn it back over to William, and he's going to be able to take it from here. Thank you guys for uh, taking the time. Um, I know that um, you know you guys have gotten a lot of really good information out of. Uh, Michael and the team uh, at Veeam, they've done a great job of ensuring that uh, Veeam's addressing all facets of ransomware and what it can do to your organizations. Um, so with that, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the high-level third-party uh, components of of the um, you know ransomware and security landscape. Um, and oh. Sorry. <laughs> um, and uh, and with that, you know, NIST has put together a great uh, cybersecurity framework um, to talk about uh, security uh, and uh, how it should be applied to organizations of all shapes and sizes, right? Um, and as you look at uh, this entire framework, they've they've kind of boiled it down to kind of five critical functions across 23 categories. It's still a little intimidating, um, but I think for most organizations. Uh, it's something that you can eventually wrap your head around. So let's kind of walk through those five core functions and really try to understand, you know, uh, what that looks like. So um, the first thing you have to do is understand the risk profile of your organization. You have to identify your critical assets. You have to build uh, a, a matrix of criticality and desired availability. Um, and you've got to figure out what you're willing to spend to protect against uh, certain types of either interruption, availability, or data loss. And so you have to kind of start there. It's mostly an information gathering exercise. Um, there's a lot of good uh, nuggets that are in that cybersecurity framework from NIST that talk about ways you can do that through interviews, through asset management uh, portals and device, you know, uh, uh, inventory management systems that you might have, IPAM, et cetera. The next thing you had to do is go about protecting that data, right? So how do you protect 
uh, that critical data with the right safeguards to make sure that everything is uh, is is um, basically um, protected the way that you expect it to be protected. Um, you know, with that, you have to understand, you know, what you're willing to spend to protect against some of these things. So you've identified this critical data, you've figured out solutions to protect it, uh, and you've started to implement safeguards, and you're spending in accordance with the level of criticality and your budget and things like that. And so there's all kinds of fancy jargon that are used to help uh, kind of identify this, you know, annual loss expectancy and um, size of loss and some of these uh, kind of key elements to creating that. But I think that if you follow the framework, it'll help you kind of understand um, how you should address some of these components. And not, not the not the same thing for everybody. A lot of organizations come to us and they talk to us about you know, their 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 original desire is, I want to replicate everything. I want it to be you know one button failover. I want everything to work perfectly, uh, and I want to get have no data loss whatsoever. And you have to start having a conversation with these organizations and saying, okay, well, what is this data that you're protecting? How much does it matter to your business? What does downtime look like? Have you talked to your stakeholders in, in, internally to try to understand, you know, what the um, the impact your business would be if you started to uh, have issues or if you if you became under ransomware attack and your data was potentially gone? What would that mean to your organization? Right. Um, and I think that as you start to kind of uh, identify those things, figure out what you're willing to spend to protect it, um, you're going to not only you know kind of put yourself in the driver's seat with the business, at the same time, you're going to be doing your job effectively and protecting that data. Then comes the hard part. How do you figure out uh, how to detect these issues? How do you respond to them once they've been detected? And a lot of things. Um, you know, a lot of tools and a lot of companies are building solutions to detect threats, to um, to find ways to respond to them quickly, whether that's for, through human intervention or through automation. Um, but the reality to all of this is you have to be able to recover from the issue, right? And ultimately, I talk about backups and safe, tested uh, data sanitized, or not data sanitized, but the data sane um you know uh, backups are your last line of defense if everything else goes to hell in a handbasket a solid backup can save the day does that mean that no data has been leaked and sensitive stuff has not gotten out no does that mean that uh you know uh you you haven't taken an outage or or you haven't you know come under fire from your customers because your availability has been uh disrupted in some way Possibly no, but what it does mean is that all of the critical data that you hold near and dear to your business isn't gone forever. And a lot of times that's what ransomware means, whether intentionally or unintentionally. And we see it all over the place, right? A lot sometimes it's just malicious, they're scamming you to get you to pay, and then they have no intention of actually, you know, giving you back access to your data. Um, the second one is a lot of times these especially as this ransomware as a service that uh, that Michael talked about has become to fruition, um, you know, what we've seen is is a lot of um, poorly written malware in ransomware or ransomware that becomes uh, malware in the case of uh, the encryption is poor, um, you know, there's data loss during the, 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 the unencryption process, um, the key's not correct that they give you and they don't know which key it is, there's all kinds of badness that can happen post paying a ransom. And even if the attacker didn't mean to uh, prevent you from ever accessing your data again. So maintaining that ability to recover and be resilient is essential. It's extremely important to your, to your company. Um, and then it's a availability to, uh, to kind of uh, get your data under control. So I'm gonna pause again for a second. I'm gonna talk about uh, bring up a couple more polls. Um, uh, hopefully everybody can stay engaged, get those questions in. I'm gonna answer them at the end um, and try to get everybody kind of on the same page about what uh, ransomware, what is ransomware, how it can affect your business and what you can do to protect it. So I'm gonna launch a poll that's gonna ask about how satisfied you are 
uh, about your infrastructure availability? Like how satisfied are you with the data protection uh, solutions that you have in place? Uh, how well, how good of a job do you think you're doing as an organization in protecting that data? So um, hopefully everyone's still engaged, they're listening, they're bringing it up. So the three options we have is, yes, I'm doing it, but I'd like to look at other options. Uh, no, I, I, I don't think we're, we've got this under control and I'm kind of looking actively. And then the third one is, um, you know, I, I think that, uh, I'm doing an okay job, but I just need to figure out a better way to do it. Right. And you're looking for somebody to help you in that. All right. A little lower participation than at the beginning. I know I'm probably like getting into people's, you know, lunchtime, depending on where you're at. Um, so. Let's get that over 50%. I'll give it one more second here to get over 50%. And um, so, okay, we had 67% say, okay, you know, yes, but I'm looking at the market. 25% said, no, I'm not doing this well at all. And I'm looking at different ways to do it. Um, eight, only 8% said, you know, I feel like I'm doing it okay, but I'm, I'm really uh, gonna make a change. I know that I'm not, you know, meeting the right thing. Maybe it's a lot of times that is, you know, you've had a great vendor for a long time, but you know that, different technologies now exist that are helping you uh, a little bit better. Maybe you're more cost effective. Uh, that's typically kind of what we see. Uh, thank you everyone again for staying engaged and, and voting on this. I got one more for you. All right. And then if you look at the, uh, my sales team threw this in here. Sorry guys. Uh, you know, if you're looking at, you know, at these solutions, what type of time frame are you talking about? Are you looking to change, make a change immediately? Are you looking at something for 2021? Um, I won't make uh, you know you guys endure this too long here. We'll get it up over 40%, and then uh, I'll close it down. All right, that's a pretty good distribution. 12% said less than three months. 19% three to six months. 25% six to 12 months, and 44% uh, creeping down to 43% in uh, next year. Basically, looking at it next year budget for next year. Um, you know, I think for me. As a technologist, um, as long as you do it, <laughs> right? Uh, I don't care when you tackle these things. Probably sooner is better. Um, but you know, as long as you're taking steps to improve, um, that is the charge that you guys have. Most of the people on the call are in the systems administration area, um, and and the charge you have your organization is protect the data, uh, ensure its availability, um, and uh, and ensure that the data is not uh, uh, compromised or manipulated in some way that could be detrimental to the organization, right? So uh, along with the many other myriad of things, especially for the small business that we talked about at the beginning, you know, we had 78% plus small business. You're probably the security guy, the network guy, and the IT guy, right? So um, you have a lot of hats to wear and you guys need to look for solutions that make it simple and easy. Uh, you know, Veeam's used that it just works slogan for a long time it's because it does, it's simple and easy and it has native cloud data protection um, kind of in place. So thank you again to everyone that voted. I'm gonna close that one down and kind of move on here. All right, and I do apologize to everyone for the, uh, for the mute scenario there. Uh, my computer was being weird. I also wanna thank uh, my friend Brian who is on the uh, polls or on the questions area telling me that my laptop was slowly dying um apparently i had it plugged into a, a not strong enough power supply and it was just creeping down slowly even though it was plugged in so thank you brian for uh pointing that out all right so um how can you fight this evil beast right um and it's by far the most uh common type of malware at this point right there's a far uh less kind of uh just uh data leakage sit around your network especially small business hoping to find something it's much easier to get a quick win and just like trap your data and ask you to pay to get it back um so a lot of criminals have sharply moved over to this kind of ransomware category but high level making sure that you're following some type of guidance some type of framework even if it's not NIST because you think it's too complicated right go and choose a plan figure out a plan to get some level of holistic security endpoint server network right storage um backup 
uh, and, and, and disaster recovery plan, at least, even if it's not a technical solution, have a plan for what you're going to do uh, when that when the time comes, not if the time comes that you're going to have to do something, whether it's uh, for some type of technical issue or it's through some type of security issue. Um, making sure that you've got ways to detect that this has happened on your uh, your systems and your critical systems. Um, a, a lot of times, uh, the time to detection can um, greatly impact uh, the security and the availability of your data because a lot of times, uh, systems that are not as critical are the first to be infected because they got in, there's some random system that you have laying around. Um, they uh, kind of work on encrypting that machine and getting it kind of uh, you know, isolated. Uh, and then they move through the network, right? And so they start moving through your backend network, trying to figure out which systems are gonna cause you uh, the most, well, to pay, right, effectively. Um, and isolating those systems quickly can can be a lifesaver, right? And we see that, um, you know, uh, you know, that mean time to detection is uh, basically your, one of your uh, key points uh, for protecting against ransomware and any type of malware, honestly. Um, you know, having that early detection is imp is important, and then protecting against it is the most essential, right? Like, if it all, you know, if every system you have is compromised, you know, hopefully you've taken steps to ensure that you have a clean backup that hasn't been compromised by the ransomware. There's many ways that Veeam offers to to kind of help that. And then, as uh, recently with V10. Uh, cloud pro providers like PhoenixNap have become even more important because we actually offer immutability capabilities that would physically, logically prevent the malware from changing the data. We have the ability with our object storage integration to set the data to be immutable. Uh, and at that point, there is no way for you to administratively delete that data outside the policy. And I think that's super critical um, if you're trying to ensure that without a doubt, you have a clean backup. We talked through all this, I'm not gonna belabor some of these points. Get all of this information together and get to those RTO, RPO goals. What does your organization need to survive? Um, and what, and that'll basically help you with your budget, right? That'll help you try to understand what type of insurance, which is effectively what offsite backup disaster recovery as a service are, is it's, it's technical insurance effectively. There's a technical implementation there, but the goal here is to uh, take these steps uh, to protect uh, you this from ever happening and hopefully spend far less than what it would cost if the data actually was gone forever. So, why do you want to do this in the cloud versus yourself, right? So back in the day, everyone would buy more infrastructure, buy more technology, put a second site up, replicate all their data, uh, spend a lot of time, a lot of money, and a lot of, uh, you know, kind of headache um, on an environment that you probably would never use um, in the lifespan of that infrastructure. At some point, you're gonna need to fill over. Some point, something's gonna happen. It's gonna be important that you have it, but um, you may go four, five, six years before that actually occurs. And um, that infrastructure you purchased and you put in a colo environment somewhere and you plumbed with networking and you paid that network bill for and you 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 had some type of replication technology applied to, to replicate all over to that other environment. All those <coughs> costs are born by you as a single tenant person. Um, and that gives you no ability to actively participate in what this concept of insurance looks like, right? You know, how many of you on the call, I don't have a way to pull this, but how many of you on the call actively go and buy a second car just in case you crash your first car? That's what we are talking about when we talk about buying a second site, replicating to it, just in case your primary site has some type of availability or security issue, right? What do you do instead? You pay for an insurance policy. Everybody pays into insurance policies and uh, you effectively share the cost with your neighbor, right? That's what Cloud DR can do for them. I'm not talking about our just our Cloud DR services, any Cloud DR service. The, the idea, as long as you're choosing a multi-tenant approach to cloud disaster recovery, 
um, will give you some better economies of scale. It'll get you out of the hardware business. It keeps you from saving that, you know, saving the cap, keeps you from spending the CapEx that you would have to build it, keeps all the headache of maintaining that environment away. And a lot of times the solutions are better. And what we're finding is that the cloud service provider focused uh, replication technologies and solutions are actually superior to the uh, on-prem solutions because the shift to cloud disaster recovery is here, right? It's happening. And all of the uh, vendors, Beam included, that are building technology are starting to build DRAS technology as the first class citizen and single tenant DR functionality as the next tier down, right? Um, and, and for some vendors, if they want to invest in it at all, right? And you see this in some other um, uh, backup and, and replication vendors that have started to create their own cloud service provider product. They're just sending you to the cloud and they're completely kind of not taking away the functionality, but they're not enhancing the functionality around, um, you know, single company uh, disaster recovery. So you get that global availability, you get that cost savings and you get that sharing uh, the environment with your, uh, with your uh, fellow man. Now Beam has been a leader in this space because in 2014, which sounds ever ago, right? 2014 and into early 2015, uh, Veeam launched a cloud-based disaster recovery capability that costs you, the Veeam user, no more money uh, from Veeam. You have to buy any extra licensing, this is the point, um, to use this technology. Veeam invested in marrying up cloud service providers and end users to make uh, global Veeam-based disaster recovery as a service uh, technology footprint, right? It's fast. Uh, it's getting faster. I'm not going to make any comments on how or when because you know my friends at Beam would kill me, but it's going to get a lot faster. Um, it's extremely secure. Um, you know, you got that really low recovery time objective. You know, you're talking with uh, with our services. The SLA can be as low as two hours. The reality is, it's you know minutes. Right. As long as you've pre-plumbed the network, as long as you've got everything in place uh, to help that recovery happen quickly, um, you know we've uh, we've definitely done a lot of work to make it easy. And then the last one is uh, you know that simple onboarding. We're talking from click to protection uh, in uh, at least of the first byte of data in minutes. Right. So we work out. Uh, some of the commercial aspects of it, or you're doing a proof of concept or whatever is occurring, uh, you're putting in a URL, a username, a password, and selecting the stuff you want to replicate and pressing go. No VPNs, no extra technology in place, nothing to integrate or buy or download or anything. It's just go. As long as you have Veeam um, uh, on-prem, like standard enterprise and enterprise plus, uh, it's there for you and uh, and ready to be used uh, right now. So really quick protection. The rest of the, the time it takes is literally how fast can you replicate the data. We also offer offline seeding options that is totally possible. If you have a low uh, bandwidth amount, um, but a lot of data, let's say you've got 15 T, but you've only got 100 meg or less on-prem and you're using a lot of that for your, for your users, um, we have ways to, uh, we can supply you with kind of um, seed boxes um, that are, uh, you know, at no cost to be able to, to, to take one, put all your data on it, ship it back to us. Um, it's a, a pretty simple way to kind of get started. So summarizing, we've got direct integration with, uh, well, we have some new technologies with Veeam 10, but um, I think all the way back to, Michael, I don't know, I think all the way back to like Veeam 8, at this point, it's supported. Uh, so yep, if you haven't correct. updated, which Veeam does a really good job of pushing people forward, uh, but I think from Veeam 8 forward, um, you know, it works with our service provider technology, so you can get it done quickly. And we're doing DR as a service in four uh, diverse geographic locations today. We're offering backup as a service in six geos today. Um, and then on the DR side, we're only supporting vSphere. So sorry, Hyper-V guys, um, that's uh, kind of, where we're at today so i'll start to kind of wrap things up and get to some questions um we've got a ton of different solutions a lot powered by veeam um, that can help protect you from a data security perspective 
um, and we'll kind of work through some of the questions uh, as we go here. All right. So uh, my friend RJ uh, asked about our immutable backup functionality. Absolutely, RJ. Um, we've been a leader in the object storage space for a while. Um, we've uh, been working with Veeam's, I think Veeam's closest partner. You've seen uh, um, a lot of announcements lately on Cloudian, the S3 uh, compatible on-prem storage. We leverage it as a service provider to provide, um, you know, extremely, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Compliant, extremely compliant S3 uh, functionality. So pretty much everything that AWS uses from S3, all those APIs, uh, all those implementation characteristics uh, exist in our object storage platform, and we have direct integration with that, um, either through the Cloud Connect capabilities of Veeam or even natively through the Cloud Tier capabilities of Veeam that integrate with uh, with the um, the archive uh, capabilities in object storage. Um, uh, Chris asks, how can I keep my Veeam on-site repositories protected from ransomware? Seems that the current ransomware starts by shutting down AV and encrypting backups is the first step. Um, so uh, the, the on-site Veeam repositories are definitely harder. Um, Michael, I don't know if you guys have taken steps there. Can you comment on that at all? To, to you know, if they're not using a, something with the immutable flag uh, object storage on-prem? Sure, sure, absolutely. So, you know, really a good way to do that is yeah. one, test test the backup. One, put it in sure backup. Okay. But let's just say you don't have the AV or you don't have, you know, the antivirus to back it up. Veeam actually has built in to check for check for malware, check for corruptions, maybe a, a you know, array went bad. It's going to tell you that while actually performing the the uh the backup in sure backup to when it tests it. So yeah, I mean that's how you're going to keep that that on-prem repository up and up and going for you. Sweet. So there you go, RJ. Um, like I said, as long as you uh, take take advantage of some of those technologies, and then if you leverage the back of the service from providers like Phoenix Snap, um, we can help you out in protecting against uh, those uh, critical um, stuff. Um, Scott asked if there's vendors working with Hyper-V. Absolutely. Uh, Veeam has a service provider, um, find a service provider portal. Um, you can go there, you can check DR as a service or VA back of as a service and click Hyper-V. Um, we do support Hyper-V for offsite backup as a service, so you can still send us Hyper-V based uh, VPKs, um, but we can't offer you a replication uh, failover that's native to Veeam. We have other solutions for that, um, but but we don't have a, a Veeam based solution that is uh, Hyper-V to VMware conversion on the fly. All right, let's see here. And then let's see. Oh, uh, somebody mentioned it. Uh, we need to make a uh, uh, asymmetric encryption correction on our WannaCry bullet point. And I think with that, we're going to call to a close one minute before the end. I want to thank Michael from Beam for joining us today on the webinar. Thank you, guys. I will Absolutely. I want to thank everybody for jumping on, taking the time out of their day. Um, there's a, some stuff down in the, uh, I think there's some handouts and takeaways that you guys can look at. And I think we're going to be sending out a copy of the recording as well. So thank you guys very much. Uh, we'll wrap it up there. And I hope everyone has a great rest of their week.